We're just really excited to have you all here uh, for this event. My name is Cindy Landis, and I am the Instruction and Outreach Librarian here at Forsyth Library. Um, so Forsyth Library asked Angela to come um, and do this talk for us here to share the story about Nicodemus, because um, at Forsyth we have quite a collection in preserving Kansas history, and um, we just found this a, to be a great story and connection to our local community, but also it aligned really well with this year's um, Black History Month, uh, Black Migration. So um, if you drive north of town, past Walmart, you may notice that black, or that brown um, historic site sign, Nicodemus 53 more miles. Has anyone been out to Nicodemus? All right. Hey, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> So if you have not, I encourage you to go. Um, I find it a great place. I go there um, many times a year for the different events that we have. Um, so Nicodemus is a small, unincorporated town in Graham County. And it's the oldest and only remaining all African-American settlement that's west of the Mississippi River. So today it's a National Historic Site. Um, and it has several events throughout the year through the Nicodemus Historical Society. So some upcoming events are the Chautauqua series, which in, involves um, living history characters, reacting, and performing under Big Tent, kind of the old Chautauqua uh, tradition on May 25th. They also do reenactments of the Ellis Trail tour on June 8th. And then the event that I always end up coming to, which I always enjoy, is the Nicodemus Emancipation and Homecoming, which is that last weekend in July. Um, and you can find those events and more information at the www.nicodemushistoricalsociety.org. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Ms. Angela Bates, and she is a descendant of the first settlers to Nicodemus in 1877, and she's been a critical piece in keeping that Nicodemus story alive. Um, she's worked to get Nicodemus designated as a National Historic Site and is a speaker for the Kansas Humanities Speakers Bureau. Um, she's a founder, past president of the Nicodemus Historical Society and Museum. And over the years, she's received several awards um, for her work in preserving African American history. So let's welcome Angela Bates. Podium's kind of fall. I, I, I can hide behind it. Is that going to be all right with everybody? Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, before I even do that, somebody better uh, tell me what time it is and give me about uh, 15 minutes before um, this is all over. I'll just keep going. <laughs> so, John, can you do that? Yeah, about, about 45 minutes in just say, okay. okay. Um, I am Angela Bates, the um, executive director, trying to retire of the Nicodemus Historical Society. Uh, it's been 30 some years since I uh, started this passion. But just a little bit about me before I get into the presentation. I was um, born in Waukini, Kansas. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say in 1952, so I'm 66. Um, but my parents moved to California, Southern California, in 1956, I think it was, somewhere around there. So I grew up in Pasadena, California. But we would come back to the big celebration every year. So I spent a couple of weeks um, out of the year every summer in Nicodemus. So it was like a, a two-week summer camp in our own all-black town. And I used to tell all of my friends, uh, you know, we got our own all-black town, we're going home. And they were like, yeah, right. And it's true, we have our own all-black town. I was very proud of that. So it's neat to grow up in a, a nice urban area in California, but then in contrast, to spend a couple of weeks in Nicodemus where really it was fun. You know, nobody had running water, so we was using the pump and my aunt had the best water. Oh God, it was good. And then we had um, chickens, Everybody had chickens and gardens and pigs and cows and horses, and boy, did I have a good time. And I hated leaving Nicodemus going back to California. So I think that's where I really kind of developed the passion of wanting to come back home. Um, my parents both uh, were born and reared in, in Nicodemus, knew each other as children growing up. 
Um, and my mom died about uh, 12 years ago, and my dad died about a year and a half ago. Uh, but they spent um, their latter years after they retired from California and, brought, and bought the Maddie Bibbs farm, which is just a mile north of Nicodemus, which is a farm that my mother always wanted when she was a kid. She said, if I have to stay here and we can't go to the city, I would love to have a farm like uh, Maddie and Cass Bibbs. And when they got ready to retire and move back, the farm was up for sale and they actually got that. So um, it's neat that they got a chance to spend uh, their last years um, back at home in Nicodemus. Now the farm uh, belongs to my uh, two sisters and I, and we are using the house as a guest house, and um, we're trying to do some other things. Um, and it took my cousin, John Ella Holmes, who is sitting here, to tell me that I was a farmer. I said, I don't think so. He said, no, well, yeah, you are. And I said, no, I'm not a farmer. I may be a historian, but I'm not a farmer. Uh, by all definitions, I am a farmer, which is really interesting. Um, but I, I graduated from high school, and then I went to uh, school in Emporia. So I have a degree in education and psychology from an Emporia. And then I went to the East Coast. Um, I, I had a son um, at the time, and he's 46 right now. And uh, we moved to the D.C. area where my ex-husband was from. And I worked for a couple of research and development companies. I had a top secret clearance, and I did uh, training programs and um, developed training programs and, and ad analyzed training de uh, testing data for different weapon systems. I don't know how I got into that, but it made me paranoid. And I thought, i got to get out of this. This is not really for me. But it taught me a lot of the skills that I am using today, which is something I couldn't appreciate until now. Um, then I uh, left the D.C. area after about 13 years and moved to Denver. Lived in Denver for about six, six years. Um, and then moved to uh, Nicodemus area um, in 1989. And I've been there ever since. Um, it's a place that I love. It's a part of my history. I feel very fortunate um, that I have uh, inherited such a, a legacy. And so I feel that what I'm doing um, is, is no more than what my forefathers have done, maybe even less than what they had to endure because they endured slavery. Um, but all of those that I stand on top of, I want to tell their story. I want to preserve their history. And it's a story that is not our own personal family story, but it's a story of, 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 of an, it's a national story. It's of national significance because as a national historic site, we actually <coughs> represent what African Americans did with their freedom after emancipation. That's a good turning point or starting point. So let me start uh, before uh, emancipation, what was actually going on in the South. Um, and let me say this also, that most of the people that came to Nicodemus and stayed over the long haul were originally from uh, Georgetown and Lexington or Scott County and Fayette County, Kentucky. Um, there were people that did come in from Mississippi and Tennessee, and then other people came in from other places. But the large groups of people that actually came in were fr primarily from um, Kentucky and the Bluegrass area in particular. Um, so in order to understand the, the story of Nicodemus and the migration and all, I always like to take people back to that time period uh, during slavery and put you in the mindset of a slave. I know you're not slave, whether you're black or white, doesn't matter, but you're going to be in the mindset here in a minute. And, and in order for you to really understand, you have to have that kind of perspective. Then you can see what the motivation, uh, the motivations were for people to actually come and um, the tenacity uh, and the determination they had to stay. Um, in Kentucky, slavery was a little bit different than it was, say, on the eastern uh, coast of um, the United States where they had large uh, rice plantations and they had large slave labor. Um, you know, it was, uh, a lot of the plantations would have as many as 200 slaves or more. So in Kentucky, um, the land was not conducive for large farms. Um, or large plantations. Just the lay of the land, the topography of the land just was not conducive to large slave labor. So you, you see um, plantations, and really they didn't even call them plantations because they weren't that big. Um, there, were, there was only about 5% of the white population in Kentucky that actually owned uh, slaves. And on average, they uh, owned between 20 and 25 slaves. So it usually was one or two families or an extended family. So the dynamics of slavery in a place like Kentucky where the, uh, you don't have these large plantations is different than in an area where you have a huge plantation, large 
slave labor uh, needed to produce these crops. And, and I say that because the dynamics of that, that, that um, whole situation um, kind of support some of the stuff I'm going to tell you as it relates to slavery in Kentucky. Now, slavery was an ugly institution. Everybody can agree to that. Um, it's unfortunate, though, that we walk around with these stereotypical images in our head about what slavery was like. We really think it was black and white, and I did too, until I started really digging into the history, and I found out that really it, it, it varied from plantation to plantation, from region to region. You just couldn't do a direct comparison. Um, and so in, in Kentucky, they did have the corner, corner of the market for uh, selling women to the Louisiana market. And the Louisiana market, they had an insatiable um, desire to have mistresses, and they wanted them to be mixed blood women, because they, the they were the most beautiful women. Um, and maybe some of you guys have heard about the mask and unmasked balls. Well, that's what those were all about. And they gave rise to the cotillions that uh, are still going on today. People, women going, being presented to society. But their roots, really, of that is um, in this, this whole desire for um, these French to actually um, have mistresses. And Kentucky, in particular, had the corner of the market. So, and the reason they had the corner of the market is because they um, literally, uh, they could get $5,000 to $6,000 uh, a woman um, if she was mixed blood and she was pretty. And um, that was, you know, two or three times the amount they could get for a good man that would sell, say, for say like $1,700 or $1,500. And so they supplied the, the market, um, Louisiana market, with these mixed blood women. Um, what, also is, what is also interesting about slavery in Kentucky, because of these small plantations, you have a lot of slaves that really are skilled workers. Uh, the crop at that time really was hemp. And of course, nobody knows what that word means. <laughs> like, don't laugh. That makes you, means that you may have had some. <laughs> um, hemp was the staple crop. crop. A lot of people think it was uh, tobacco. Well, tobacco didn't become the king crop until after uh, the Civil War was over. And then that's when um, tobacco became king in uh, Kentucky. But prior to that, it was really hemp. And I bet a lot of the hemp that we see here in Kansas, because there were a lot of folks, uh, white, black, and what have you, that came from Kentucky. So I think some of these wild fields of hemp probably have their roots in those that came out years before. But seriously. Um, but uh, they had rope factories. And so a lot of the slaves were uh, employed uh, by these rope factories, and some of them were spinners and what have you. Um, so, after, and, and, and also Kentucky was a, um, a border state, and they never uh, seceded to the, to the Union, uh, seceded from the Union. So they remained uh, a neutral state throughout the Civil War. However, they did have the Union camps there that African American <coughs> people, men in particular, could join the the Civil War at that time as well as their families and people that wanted to seek refuge and get their freedom because Lincoln said if you go to these camps you know we'll you'll be securing your freedom um, so that's kind of the history of, of um, slavery in Kentucky but as a slave what was it really like well you know you couldn't learn to read and write that was not something that was legal um, so if you got caught with any papers uh, or caught, being caught uh, reading, you could be punished. You could actually lose uh, your hand. You could actually you know, get branded in your face like one of the town fathers who wore a brand because he had learned to read and write. Um, you could not legally get married. And even though slaves would jump the room and, and, and have their ceremony and be married, it wasn't until after emancipation that they could actually get their marriages legalized. And then they had to go back and get remarried, get filed at the courthouse, and then it was legal. And then they had these laws that said, well, uh, the woman that had his first children that jumped the room with him had the right. Because if he had been sold to several different plantations, he may have had <coughs> several wives, several children. And so uh, a lot of the women uh, wanted to take claim to their husbands at the time of emancipation, so they had to institute a law that would decide who legally had the right to him. And of course, he could say, I don't want to be married to none of them. I'm out of here. <laughs> um, a lot of them didn't have a choice. 
And the choice, choice is a real word to kind of uh, describe what things were like before emancipation, after emancipation. Before emancipation, there was no choice in anything. If you wanted to name your child um, uh, Princess, like in that movie, which was uh, the sequel to Roots, um, Queen was the name of it. Many of you may have seen that. Um, there's a scene where she says that she wants to name her daughter a princess. Well, when the master, who was the father of the child, records the name, he says, no, I don't like princess. I'm going to call her queen. So she didn't have a choice. She may not even have a choice as to who she actually slept with. And so during slavery, you have this mindset of you don't have a choice in anything. Um, you may have uh, lived on a plantation, uh, let's just say it was in Ellis. Um, and you heard about Hayes, but you never had an opportunity to go to Hayes because you don't have any reason to go to Hayes unless the master said, well, I want you to go to uh, the stores and pick up supplies and what have you. Then they would give you a pass and then you were allowed to go. But if anyone stopped you on the way, um, you had to show them the pass. But most people that were enslaved at that time could not just get up and go. So when emancipation rolled around, they have a choice. Okay, where am I gonna go? I heard about this place called Hayes but I'm not sure exactly where it's at. Now, they say it's in that direction. I think that's east of here from Ellis, but I'm not really sure because I knew someone that ran away and they thought they were going north and they went further south. So I'm not really sure what the directions are. Really? Um, I can't uh, read and write, so uh, okay, now I'm emancipated and yeah, I can pick up the paper and read it, but I don't know how to read it. So the, the federal government created what was called the Freedmen's Bureau and the Freedmen's Bureau uh, was set up so that African Americans could acclimate and uh, assimilate into the American culture. So they started these schools that were called Freedmen's Schools in different places. They had different names for them, but there were Freedmen Schools. And these Freedmen Schools were set up so that African Americans could learn to read and write and get some basic education. These Freedmen Schools also became the first, um, well, they were the precursor to public education because believe it or not, not only were slaves ignorant, most people were, unless they could afford to hire people to teach their children. So the Freedmen Schools became the first schools that would allow African Americans to learn to read and write. And so this was, like I say, the precursor to public education. They also provided um, a bank or banks uh, for African Americans because how were they going to survive? So they uh, created these banks that were called Freedmen's Banks so that the uh, uh, former slaves could borrow money. Um, they also provided people that would renegotiate their contracts with their former masters uh, because, you know, you got to pay them now. They're not going to work for free. Um, and so you can imagine what it was like uh, during that time period right after the Civil War. Say I was a white master that had uh, 10 slaves and I took one of them the day before beating and then took the, uh, the mother and sold that mother away and the father's still on the plantation. I think I'd be scared to tell them that uh, they're free. And if I'm an African American enslaved person and, and I'm on a plantation where I've been treated pretty good because it wasn't all bad, so to speak, in every plantation. So it's a human story and it's diverse from one place to the next. And so my master's been good to me. Um, I haven't had any problem. He's never sold anyone away. He's always treated us good. Now I'm told, uh, I'm free. Uh, what's that really mean? Uh, that means you've got to take care of yourself. I am no longer going to provide for you um, in the way I've provided for you before. And so a lot of people ended up doing what they call sharecropping. And again, these are not huge plantations. These are small farms. Um, so during this time period after the Civil War, during this Reconstruction period, it was wreaking havoc. People were scared. Blacks were afraid. Whites were afraid. So that's what gave rise to you know, the Jim Crow laws, which was really trying to reinforce um, and reintroduce the laws that they could control African Americans with. So they would create laws that said, you know, you couldn't be in town after dark. You that even occurred right here in Hayes uh, and Stockton. Um, so that Jim Crow even came to Kansas. So even though people were emancipated, their minds weren't. But if I'm a slave, and I'm living in um, Kentucky at this time, and uh, I'm emancipated. And so uh, the Reconstruction is basically over. They pulled the military troops out. We're just out on our own and all, excuse my expression, but I believe all adults in here, hell broke loose. And 
the people that were being subjected to all of the physical uh, crimes was enough to, to scare anybody. And so what was going on out here in the West at the same time? Now, the Civil War is over. Reconstruction has ended. But there's still a war raging out here in the West. And guess who they were fighting? Indians. Indians. They were fighting the Indians. They were forcing them onto reservations, and they were really successful with most of them, except for a few bands that refused to go. Um, and the last Indian raid that took place here in Kansas took place in 1878. Nicodemus was established in 1877. So when these uh, Indians were traversing through the area on their way back home, so to speak, and really all the way back to Canada, um, they say they were on a killing spree. Well, you know what, they were probably trying to save themselves from being killed too. Um, so they were making uh, the West uh, safe, so to speak, for all the settlers that they were encouraging to come and settle in the West. And so what you see happening is, this is what's going on out here in the West. You got homesteading, you got these little towns popping up, these immigrant towns popping up like Jin Jin, like uh, the Volvo Germans that started uh, Ellis and what have you. All of these towns were being, um, were, were popping up. And so this was a great place of a land for opportunity. I, I, I do have some pictures here, don't I? Um, I, I get carried away. Um, so what was actually happening here was you, and specifically in Graham County, which was not organized at the time, you have um, these town speculators. Um, and some of these town speculators were from right here in the United States. Others were uh, from Europe, like uh, the Chinchin uh, people that were from Germany and the folks that uh, were from Canada uh, that started in Mar. They heard about it, so they gathered together in groups and created these little towns. That's why Kansas is so diverse in terms of the types of people that settled here. Because this was the land of opportunity, this was the promised land, and it became the promised land for African Americans also. But how did they even know to even come here? Well, there was, in the case of Nicodemus, there was a white man by the name of W.R. Hill. Let me back up a second. There was a black man named Pap Singleton um, who really considered himself of the, the, the father of the Exodus, and we hear that term, Exodusters. And those really are the people, the 40,000 African Americans that came into the state of Kansas between 1879 and 1880. Now, Nicodemus is established two years prior to that. 1877. There is a difference, although we get lumped with the Exodusters and the Exodus movement. Yes, we were making an Exodus, but it was a different type of Exodus in the sense that we were solicited by some town speculators, and we were solicited to come to Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus isn't just this little settlement, it's an organized town. And so therein lies the difference between the people that settled in Nicodemus and the people that were uh, Exodusters, because the Exodusters heard 40 acres and a mule, we're out of here. Mule or not, we're gonna go. And they got on trains, buses, and no. They got on uh, river boats, and uh, many of them walked, and they came to Kansas because this was promoted by uh, the governor uh, as the promised land. And people knew they could come here and um, actually homestead. So, the push for all of those people that had some vision were um, the Jim Crow laws. Those things were pushing people to leave the South. Um, and the draw and the pull was homesteading. Um, and then really the catalyst were people like W.R. Hill and, and the other people that organized with him the Nicodemus Town Company. And W.R. Hill was responsible for uh, places like Hutchison and Wichita, helping people get to get settled there in those towns. And so he had some experience. And so he ventured all the way out to Northwest Kansas and said, look, I can see all the way to Colorado. And there ain't nothing in between. I'm gonna create a town and name it after myself and make me some money. And so that's what he did. So he filed a claim on 161 acres with Nicodemus and uh, created the Nicodemus Town Company. And then they said, well, uh, he went into partnership with this black homesteader named Smith. And Smith and him said, okay, we're gonna start this little all-black town and then we'll start this little white town called Hill City. So they said, well, we need more than just us to create this this town company. So they went to Topeka and they met four ministers and they convinced them to go into partnership with them and they created the Nicodemus Town Company. 
then they said, okay, now, we got this uh, land that we located right here on the north side of the Solomon River. We got it planted out. We got some stakes in the ground. We want, really want a livery company here and maybe a mercantile company here. Uh, we got this little town planted out. Now, where are we going to get people to come and settle here? We're out in the middle of nowhere. So they said, well, why don't we just go back home? And home was Kentucky. And they went to the churches to promote the town. And the reason they went to the churches was because, because of the Jim Crow laws, African Americans could not gather together in large groups. Because if they did, it was fear of uprising. And do you know that mentality is still present today? If African Americans gather together in a group, whites are scared. And don't let us get happy. <laughs> Woo! We start, you know, we're very boisterous, we're very animated, and, uh, you know, we speak what's on our mind. I mean, and then we just put it away, you know. But, so the Jim Crow laws prevented them to gather into uh, large groups unless it was at a church. So they went to the churches, and they promoted the, the exodus out of the South into the state of Kansas to a place called Nicodemus, and they promised they would help them homestead. Now, the land became the draw. Homesteading became the draw. Because if you live in Kentucky and you may be doing some sharecropping, um, your, your likelihood of ever really owning any, any land is very, very limited. So to own 160 acres and someone's going to help you and all you got to do is get on a train and travel for a couple of days and you'll end up in the promised land, it sounds pretty good. It sounds good enough for about 350 people that boarded trains in the central bluegrass area of Kentucky, which is really an interesting story, too, because the railroads were, you know, they were like king. You know, the railroads were like the IT companies of today. So the railroad, um, they didn't have any transportation across the state of Kentucky going north and south. So Cincinnati is just north of um, Lexington, about, 50 mi uh, about 80 miles. So the Cincinnati Southern Railroad opened a spur that spring of 1877 that went right through the bluegrass area all the way down to Nashville, which provided transportation for those people in that area to get out. So they went to the churches, convinced folks that they needed to leave. They got on trains in Sadieville and Midway and all along uh, the route there. And when they got to um, Cincinnati, they boarded trains, which was a big hub for trains going east and west. And they got on those trains and they brought them all the way to Ellis. Now, anybody know where Ellis is? We know where, and I'm not talking about Ellis Island either. <laughs> Although we had someone that thought, you know, Nicodemus <laughs> folks got off at Ellis Island. <laughs> I won't mention any names, but it, he should have known better. But um, they got off the train in Ellis and they had still a two-day walk all the way over to Nicodemus because there was no roads. Matter of fact, uh, W.R. Hill had a compass and he had traversed the area several times and knew what the natural lands, landmarks were. And so uh, once the people got there, they got settled and he had made arrangements for uh, uh, supply wagons and so they loaded up the wagons and all 350 or so souls made a trek across uh, two valleys, the Saline Valley and then into the Solomon Valley. And um, they got in sight of Nicodemus and there was dugouts uh, from some of the people that, a few people had come from Topeka, most of them were part of the uh, founding fathers, so to speak. So they were living in these dugouts. So um, let me just back up a second. I'm gonna take you um, as a slave on that train. Our life here in Kentucky. You lived in Georgetown, which is about 10 miles or so from Lexington. You never knew where Lexington was. You just heard it was in that direction. Now you're free, and maybe you, you know, you venture out and you decide that you're going to go see this place because it's a big place uh, compared to the Georgetown that you may have happened to get a pass to go to. Um, and you live on this plantation, and if you've ever been to Kentucky, it's very woody. You know, it's just like the woods, um, and the creek. The Elkhorn Creek that runs through uh, Georgetown is really bigger and runs deeper, I think, at times than the Solomon River. So you can imagine this is the environment you're coming out of. And people were living in slave cabins that were either made out of rock uh, and stone or wood. And um, when they left Kentucky um, and they showed up on the, at the uh, train depot, you can imagine what it was like standing in front of a great big huge steam belching huge metal 
engine. Can you imagine that? You've never really seen that before because, like I said, Cincinnati Southern didn't open that up until that, that spring. And so now they're going to get on the train that's going to move. It's going to move faster than the wagon if they ever had an opportunity to be on the wagon. <coughs> move faster than a horse if they ever had an opportunity to ride a horse. So they literally, their geographic mindset was very tiny. If I lived on this plantation and I couldn't even see across the road because of the trees, unless it went to the edge, um, my mindset geographically is confined to what I've seen. So now I'm going to get on this train that's going to be moving, and I'm going to be on it for a few days, and I'm going to watch the terrain of the land change. Now, how many of you have planted trees? <laughs> so you can imagine coming from a wooded area, you know, with this mindset as a former slave, you know, you go into a place that you don't know anything about it. You just, do you really want to trust that white man that stood up there in the church and probably lied? You know, they don't know, but they put their faith in him. But they also put a greater faith in God. And they believed that what they were going to come to experience in own land was going to provide them an opportunity to really experience real freedom. So they trusted him. And when they got to Kansas and they started coming further and further and further and further west, less and less and less street. Now here we are on the High Plains prairies of Kansas, and they could probably see the color bottle. So you can imagine how they felt. They must have been really, really anxious about getting to this place called uh, Nicodemus. Well, that's one of the promotional, I keep forgetting I got these. Um, this was one of the promotional flyers that was used uh, in the Lexington area. And one of the, I like to read that first paragraph. It says, whereas we, the colored people of Lexington, Kentucky, knowing that there is an abundance of choice lands now belonging to the government, have assembled ourselves together for the purpose of locating on said lands. That meant they were going to come to Kansas, become homesteaders. It says so right there. They knew they were coming to a place where they would become landowners. And becoming landowners meant freedom. So they were leaving what was familiar to them and going to a place that was totally unfamiliar to them. And they get here, and of course the terrain is looking totally different than it looked like in Kentucky. But they still had hopes and dreams. And when they got to the town site, of course there were the few people that were living in dugouts, and that was very primitive. Can you imagine that? We've come all the way out here, we're gonna get this freedom government. We got living holes in the ground. Can you imagine that? The second group that came in 1878, several months later in the spring, uh, most of them turned around and said, we're out of here. And most of those people that went back ended up in Ellis. So the black people that ended up uh, populating Ellis were that second group of people that didn't want to stay in Nicodemus. But they came and they saw the land and they saw freedom. And they saw a way that they could make a way for themselves. They could have land. They could, they could govern themselves. And they were in an all-black town. So the draw was the land, and the push was the Jim Crow laws. And so this was two years before the big migration. And the big migration happened as a result of a man by the name of Pap Singleton, who said, I am the, the cause of the exodus. He and a couple of other people were running all over the South saying, you know, don't stay here. Why are you going to stay here? Go to the promised land. Go to the promised land. Because you can get government land there. All you got to do is take a claim and live there for five years and improve the land, and the, uh, and the government's going to give it to you for a little of nothing just for the filing paper. If you had nothing, 160 acres is a lot of land. It's even a lot of land right now. And if nothing else, you can pitch a tent. So those 350 people that came initially, they had vision. They had tenacity. And this was over 100 years before Martin Luther King's vision. You know, we, we, I think sometimes we're in a nightmare. It ain't necessarily a, a, a good dream. I think sometimes we're in a nightmare. But this was over 100 years before Martin Luther King and his dream. These people had a dream, and they made it a reality. 
And we are descendants of those people that have that vision, have that tenacity um, to make it, to create a place that they could call their own, a place they could call home, in a place that was really unfamiliar to them and at a time when Jim Crow was at its, its, at its peak. Even here on the high plains of Kansas when they were trying to uh, get settled on their land, uh, oh, let me just deviate here. This is, uh, if you wanted to go to Nicodemus, you had to pay $5 for W.R. Hill and the town company to help you get settled on your land. That's one way they made money, but they made money also by selling the town lots. If you wanted a, um, a, just a residential lot, it may cost you five, 10, $15. If you wanted to open a business, the lot may cost you anywhere from 25 to $75. That's how the town speculators made their money. Um, so when the people actually came in that first group from uh, the Lexington, Georgetown area, they literally had to dig in for the winter because they got there in September. Um, they didn't have any supplies, really very limited supplies. They didn't really have any real implements or tools or even seed to plant with. So that first winter was very, very rough. Um, and in our records, we have the story of the Osage coming to Nicodemus um, and sharing their game with the people there in Nicodemus. Now you can imagine this, I've, I survived slavery, but I've heard stories about these wild Indians, and they were wild, I'd be wild too. I'd be frustrated. I would want to hold on to my land because it was there. So we can understand why they were fighting the way that they did to hold on to what was theirs. We have a tendency in history um, to portray them as heathens, um, and we have a tendency to portray them as people with no consciousness, you know, no soul. But in the case of Nicodemus, the Osage came and they saw that they were uh, destitute and was really starving, and they shared their game with them. Now, I'm telling you, this was a year before the last Indian raid took place here in Kansas. So when they heard about the Indians coming, uh, the postmaster said, oh my God, <laughs> there's Indians coming. I can see the feathers, I can see the, you know, the, the hair blowing in the wind and they're on these horses, oh my God. And he ran through the town and he told everybody, the Indians are coming. So they ran down to the river and there were some uh, caves that they had kind of built into the embankment uh, that they had used for storage. And they ran down there as many as could and took refuge. How they communicated, I don't know, but if I want to help you and I know you're starving and I have a piece of meat and I drop it on the ground, I think you're going to probably be grateful that I did give you that. And so we attribute uh, that first year of survival not only to the Native Americans that came, but there were some settlers on the Gold Creek north of Nicodemus that also helped uh, uh, by sharing some of their wild game uh, with the people of Nicodemus. When the third group arrived, uh, that was a year later, 1879 in the spring, those people were actually from um, Leavenworth, Kansas. But it wasn't until years after I started doing research that I found out there was a connection. Because I said, why did those people come from Leavenworth? Well, they came from Leavenworth because, I'm um, back up here just a little bit. Um, this lady here and her husband seated um, are our great grand parents. And the boy that's standing at the top was the first baby born in Nicodemus. She came in 1877 and had the first baby born just a, a little less than a month after they arrived. Her name is Emma Williams. Her husband was Charles. Henry was her first son. Um, he's named um, after his uncle Henry. Um, and he's not named after his father Charlie. Uh, the second boy who was next to him is uh, my grandfather. And um, he's named after Charles, his father. Well, isn't that weird? Well, during slavery, uh, there was a practice that was pretty common among slaves. If you had children, if you could have a choice in naming your children, you would name your daughters after your sisters if you had them. Or if you didn't have any, you would name them after your master's sisters. Or you would name them, the sons, <coughs> after your brothers or your master's brothers. And that way they could keep track of one another if they got sold from one plantation to the next. So Henry is named after his uncle Henry. Um, and Emma um, and her brother Henry and her sister Ellen and her parents, Tom and Zarina, 
um, came from Georgetown, Kentucky. They were on a plantation owned by Vice President Richard M. Johnson. I love telling this part of the story. Well, uh, Vice President Richard M. Johnson was the Vice President in the 1830s under President Van Buren. And he was so controversial at the time that Van Buren said, you'll never run on the ticket with me ever again. However, he was really the first Vice President to be appointed by Congress. But he told him, you'll never run on the ticket with me again because you have done something that is so disgraceful, and that is to marry your slave. He not only married one of his slaves, her name was Julia Chen, and she had two daughters by him, and he publicly educated, didn't make any bones about it. But then when she died, and one daughter, Adeline, died, he married another slave. Her name was Phoebe. And then it's said that he divorced, well, he, none of this was really legal, but he divorced her for infidelity, that's what it says, and he married another slave. He married three of his slaves, and he didn't care what anybody thought. He said, what I'm doing is right in the eyes of the Lord. I love this woman. She works for me, but I love her. We love each other, and I'm marrying her. I don't care what anybody says. And so uh, they made political cartoons about him. So you get a chance, look up Vice President Richard M. Johnson, or just type in Richard M. Johnson and read his story. Well, what's interesting also about this is his daughter, Imogene, that survived, married a man, and I love this part. You'll love it too. <laughs> she married a white man. Now, she was like a quadroon or something like that. She was a mixed blood man. We have pictures of her, but you can't even tell that she's black. But if you had one drop of blood, now how they tested that, I don't know. But if you had one drop of blood in you that was African-American or African or whatever, then you were considered black. I'd like to see those blood tests. But anyway, I ain't got nothing on the DNA stuff that's going on right now. But she married a man by the name of Daniel Pence. Hmm. Anybody know that name? Pence. <laughs> Vice President Pence. I would love for someone to do his genealogy. I would bet. I would bet. I would. I would bet a thousand dollars that he is related to the Pences from Kentucky. And he's from Indiana, right over the border? Has anybody ever told him to do that? I bet he would lose his mind. And I know there's probably a lot of Republicans in here, and I'm not getting into that. But it would be really interesting to know if he's related to the Pences from Kentucky, and specifically the descendants of Imogene and Daniel Pence. That would just blow my mind. That would be my thing. But anyway. Um, okay, got 15 minutes? Okay, I'll hurry up. I'm going to hurry up and end. Um, anyway, long story short, uh, uh, she was, and her siblings were, uh, and parents were uh, slaves of Vice President Richard M. Johnson. And on, this is on my mother's side of the family. On my dad's side of the family, um, my great-great-great-grandfather was owned by Daniel Pence and I'm a Jean Pence. This is Henry Ella, uh, Emma's brother, uh, and this is the deed to his homestead land. And I say freedom, a dream realized. Okay, black farmers in the promised lands of Kansas. Not only was Nicodemus uh, established as an all-black town, um, and there were white merchants that lived in the town, so there were early, early on there were white people that lived in Nicodemus, but Nicodemus was promoted as an all-black town. Uh, and over the years, it slowly became an all-black town. But there were many uh, towns here in Kansas, probably the most well-known other than Nicodemus, which no longer exists, is Dunlap, which is down near uh, Council Grove, south of Council Grove. Pap Singleton created one that was down in um, uh, in the southeast part of the state uh, near, uh, I can't think of the name of the town, anyway. Um, so there were many all-black towns that sprung up, not only here in Kansas, but all over the West. And presently, the Center of Great Plains is doing a, a research project right now where they're identifying all the African Americans that homesteaded. They got started with Nicodemus, and uh, we have supplied them with a map that I did when I first moved to Nicodemus where I spent time identifying those original homesteaders uh, who homesteaded the Nicodemus Township. But they became proud farmers and land owners. Um, and what's that say? I was once a slave who owned nothing, but now I am proud to own my own land. A dream realized, and this was as a result of a big migration out of the south into the west. 
Now, if you go to the Smithsonian, I'm going to say this and I'm going to entertain some questions. But if you go to the Smithsonian, um, uh, there used to be an exhibit. This was before they built the African American Museum, and I'm, maybe they have this exhibit there now. But they talked about uh, the big migration of the African American out of the South. And they said, you know, this is the first big migration of African Americans out of the South, and it was in the 1930s to the northern states. I lived in D.C. at the time, and I would go to the Smithsonian, and I went and said, excuse me, uh, this isn't right. This is not the first migration out. And that was because this part of the history just was not known. You know they like to skip over Kansas, especially Kansas. Yes, we are. Um, and so we are part of the major settlement of the West. There were not just Indians here. There were not just Chinese working on the railroad. There were African Americans that created their own towns and were homesteaded. So we are part of the fabric of that story. And in 1976, we became a National Historic Landmark. And in 1996, we became a unit of the National Park Service and we're in Nicodemus National Historic Site. So we represent historically what African Americans did with their freedom, and that was to make a dream a reality. Okay, I'll take the question. <laughs> that are here. You know I'm a base and you know base is not fast. <laughs> okay, yeah. Where did they uh, go to trade? Did they, when they don't say it, where they accepted it, was there a problem there? Um, where did they go to trade? In the, in, the, in the early years, they would have to come to Ellis because Ellis was the, the major trade for places for, for trade. They would also go to Stockton. But all of these towns, even, even Hayes, uh, was just in its infancy. Nicodemus was established 10 years after Hayes, so all of these towns were really in their infancy. Um, when they would go to Ellis, they would go to uh, Stockton. Hill City didn't really get established until act actually Nicodemus was well established. Um, and then it became the county seat. Um, and then speaking in terms of Jim Crow, what was it like for them? Um, here's an example. Uh, the surveyor for uh, the, uh, the land surveyor, he was actually murdered. They couldn't hire people in Graham County to do the surveys for their homesteads. So Hill did some of it, and then he, almost immediately in 1878, uh, uh, I think it was March, there was two guys that showed up in Nicodemus that were well-educated, a man by the name of Abram Hall and another one, Edward P. McKay. And Edward P. McKay became the first elected, black elected official in the state of Kansas. He was elected for two terms as the state auditor. But when they came to Nicodemus, they had, uh, they were well educated, and they opened the land company, um, and uh, several other uh, people that had the skill, like Sam Garland, opened the land company. I'm pointing at him because that's his great grandson, great great grandson over there on the team. Um, uh, they opened land companies to help people get their land surveyed. Um, but Jim Crow was, it was, it was. But I always say that the environment has a way of equalizing people. And if I, if I live on a farm and my nearest neighbor is a mile away and we've got harvest coming up or they need to use the plow or the horses, they did a lot of, a, a lot of that. So prejudice and dis discrimination surely raised this ugly head, but it was always done um, at a time <coughs> when they could afford it, so to speak, because usually you couldn't afford to be prejudiced and, and exercise it, uh, discrimination in an environment like this, but it did raises something here. Yes? I mean, the, you mentioned about like Benjamin Pep Singleton, and he personally actually black nationalism and the separatism of the like a black society from the white society. So did, did the only exodus in Nicodemus also person the separatism from the white society? Or white well, society? it was more so out of necessity. I wouldn't say that they were um, purposely trying to separate themselves. But if they could create a town and name it after, uh, well, I won't say name it after themselves, but create a town where they could live in harmony, um, I wouldn't say that that was their purpose of literally trying to be separate from. But I think the environment and the economic times and the social times uh, precipitated uh, them to, to really do that. What did they do this? I knew you was going to ask that. That's only because I, I always said that. Well, Nicodemus, the name came from um, a song that was called Wait Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was a slave of African birth. Um, and the story is that he came over on the second slave ship, the Treasurer, um, and he was one of the first to purchase his freedom in the United States. 
and they sang a song about him on some of the plantations. And after uh, the Civil War was over, a man by the name of Henry Works, who was a songwriter, put it to print. And um, it became very popular, the song did, and uh, they used to do a dance called the Nicodemus Jig, and so it was very popular. But he said, uh, he was a prophet, and he said, one of these days, um, things are gonna change, and there's gonna be freedom, and African Americans will uh, have an opportunity to experience real freedom. And so the time had come, and he said in the, in the song, wake me up for the great jubilee. And they put that, uh, the lyrics to the song on the promotional flyers. They changed the chorus uh, to kind of reflect uh, the Solomon Valley, but that's where the name came from. Yes? Do you know Lorenzo Fuller's name? Lorenzo Fuller? Do I know him? Well, no, he's too young. No, I, oh, I met him. Before he died, he came to Stockton. Yeah, he, he was one of the first blacks to have their own um, radio station, I believe it was, in New York City. He was from Stockton. Yes. And Effie Green was his mother. Was his was he part of the, was his family part of the migration to Hill City? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. There were some people that literally. Let me just say this: at the time of the settlement of Nicodemus, Graham County was not organized. So Nicodemus sits literally right on the border. So all the business that had to take place really took place in Stockton and or at Kerwin at the, uh, at the land office. So a lot of people did settle to the east rather than just in the What was the population of Nicodemus? Close to 600, 6, 650. You need to know what the population is now. <laughs> yeah, what is it now? What is it now, John Ellen? We are up to 43. 43? Oh, wow. 43? I'm shocked. John Ella is my first cousin, and she is the town trustee for Nicodemus. So that's why she knows that and amongst other things. And she's also the one that's in charge of building those tiny houses that you've heard about. Yeah, she's the one. Yeah. How is this man connected? Oh yeah, that man in the plaid shirt right behind you with that hat on. Why don't you stand up, Leroy? Yeah. <laughs> Leroy is going to be performing at the Chautauqua in eight in May. Uh, Leroy, stand up, Leroy. He plays a newspaper reporter. Uh, he's also going to play one of the surveyors. Uh, but Leroy's family is connected to the whole Nicodemus story. You want to tell the story, Leroy? Simple. They had to get from Ellis. To Nicodemus, and they walked across our farm. The Walt's homestead. It's in Ellis County. I live in Trigo County across the road. Not quite halfway. And so Angela had been searching for the trail for years, and somebody said, Why don't you ask Lero? And she did, and we've been great friends ever since. And but it was in our family history that the, the blacks coming from Ellis, they walked right to our farm between the the rock house. Well, it was a dugout. He started out as a dugout too. Uh, almost the same year that they started coming to Nicodemus. And between the windmill and that, they would stop and ask for water, and, and so people were getting water. But, so that was in our history this whole time. But somebody was able to find them. We got together, and, and I, I, I really enjoyed being part of this history. Yeah, we we appreciate it because it's. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to get someone that's a part of the history to help perform some of the history. So if you want to see him, uh, come May the 25th and watch him perform under the big tent as probably the surveyor uh, who started a town called Fagan, uh, which was going to be the railroad town, so we thought, but they ended up putting the railroad town above where I live, just a mile and a half to the east. Any more questions? Anybody over here? I know you all over there. I know you know all the answers, so I won't answer. Anybody else have any questions? You guys have been a wonderful audience, and I appreciate it. Thank you.